makes no noise. Good evening, everybody. Um, I would, uh, we're going to start, and I'm going to start. So um, let me introduce myself. Should I introduce other people? Oh, you're going to start. You can introduce us. <laughs> all right. I'm not going to start, but Rick Murphy's going to start. So let me introduce the people who are on the panel. First of all, I'm John Thornton. I'm at Boston University. Um, I do uh, the history of Africa, <laughs> like a lot of people here. Um, and um, Linda, Linda Haywood, my colleague and co-author of our book, which I'm going to be drawing quite a bit from, the Central Africans, Atlantic Creoles, and the Founding of the Americas. Um, so um, to my right is Rick Murphy. Rick Murphy represents one of the descendants um, of the original group of Africans who, who came here in 1619. Um, he's going to, to talk a lot about um, the longer story than I do, and that's why we're going to have him go first, and then he's going to give us a big overview. I'm going to follow. Then we're going to have uh, James Sweet, um, who is going to talk about, I guess you might call the prehistory of what we're talking about, which is to say the slave trade and slavery to the Americas before 1619. Um, so, um, and our, our discussant will be Joseph, Linda Haywood. Linda, <laughs> Linda Haywood is also at Boston University. I sort of introduced you with me, but uh, that's not really fair. So, Linda Haywood, as many of you know, is, uh, is the author of the, the, the new biography of Queen Jinga. Um, a wonderful book, I might say. I recommend everybody get a copy immediately. Um, and she is going to talk about the memorialization of 1619 historically up till the present day, how it's been recognized in the United States um, over, over the years, a, a story which you'll be surprised to hear. Okay, so uh, we'll start right away with Rick Murphy, who's going to make his first presentation. Good evening, everyone. Now, we're having a little, okay, there we go. We're having a little technical difficulty because I'm supposed to be able to see what you all see on the screen there. Um, thank you, John, for that kind and warm introduction. Um, as John indicated, I am a descendant from two of the Angolans who came over in 1619, um, and the family lineage has been documented several, several times. And, and what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about who these Angolans were. Um, according to history, we were not supposed to know them by name. We're not supposed to know where they came from. We're not supposed to know the circumstances in which they came. We're not supposed to know anything about them, and the reason why that's important is if you don't know anything about them, that helps fulfill the, 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 the false narrative that they were slaves, that they brought no skills, they had no skills, and so forth and so on. And I'm gonna show you a very interesting story, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to have it um, come back to actual documentation to show how much of a false narrative this is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the path of 1619 um, the arrival of the first documented Africans in English North America. Now, we know that they're not the first Africans here, and I want to be clear about that. Um, but there is so much documentation on them that we didn't know about, that we now know about, that there is no way we can say that they weren't the first documented Africans. Now, they arrived on August 25th, 1619, and on August 25th, 2019, was the 400th commemoration. And many of you will probably have kept up with all the articles that have been in the newspapers. The media really embraced this story about six months ago. And it was really a long journey to help people to understand who these particular men, women, and children were. Now, what I learned in school, um, elementary, middle, high school, and college, is very different than what we know today. So we now know who knew, we now know. So we say that because it kind of blends it all together. Now what we now know is the circumstances of their arrival. And it was a very interesting arrival because they're documented on a number of continents. Now they came on a ship, um, and some of you may be aware of the story, and I'll kind of go through it a little bit, um, but the circumstances of the arrival. Now I don't know how many of you in the audience who are Americans of African descent, now, that doesn't mean that you can't be a European American with African DNA because we're now finding that that to be the case. But most of us don't know anything about our ancestors or the circumstances that they came over on. Now we know so much based on a, a book that came, uh, um, um, the work of Ingel Sluter in 1997. And he found some documents in the Portuguese and Spanish archives. And it's through those documents, through 1997, that we know so much about these particular Africans. So 
we now know so much about them. Now, we now know that they came from an area called Angola, specifically Cabasa, Angola, which was the royal city in which they came from. And this is kind of what it looked like back then, um, beautiful area, the Blue Plateau. It's, there's a lot of information we have about these particular Angolans. They were enslaved when they left Angola. I'll talk more about that. They were sent down to Luna, Angola as enslaved men, women, and children. They were branded and they were put on slave ships. That's the short version of it all. The ship they were put on was called the San Juan Bautista. Now there were 36 ships that were in the harbor at that particular time. The Portuguese who had traded with these Angolans for almost 150 years all of a sudden found out that their royal city was on top of a silver mine. I need not say any more after that. Once they found silver, you knew what was going to happen. They sent 36 ships loaded with soldiers. They captured those soldiers, and the, one of the last ships to arrive was one of the first ships to leave, and that was the San Juan Bautista. Now, I'm going to kind of get into a little bit how we know some of this information, but you know what? I was floored. Now, some of you may have computers that were made in Japan. Some of you may have watches that were made in Japan. But the San Juan Bautista, this is what the ship looks like. And that ship was made in Japan. Who knew? Now, the emperor of Japan was toying with the idea of his island nation becoming a Christian nation. So he had this ship built. And he toured the world and decided he did not want his nation to become a Christian nation, so he sold the ship to Spain and became part of the Spanish Armada, and it was renamed the San Juan Bautista. This is a replica of that ship, and this ship today is anchored in Japan, and that's what that ship looks like, directly from the specs. Now, what's interesting about this particular ship, there were 300 enslaved men, women, and children. Look how small it is. Amazing that it left Africa and made it to North America. Now, what happened was, when they decided to take these Angolans, the Portuguese knew they needed to take the smartest, the brightest. They were the first to leave. Many of them were educated in Europe. Many of them spoke multiple languages. They were Catholic, and they had Catholic names. When they put them on the ship, after a couple of weeks, they became so sick that Captain Acuna, remember that name, Captain Acuna stopped in Jamaica, and he traded 24 young boys for medicine and food. Now, it's very interesting because this really is a story about DNA, and somebody remind me about DNA before I get too far off because I only got 15 minutes with this presentation. After they left Jamaica, what happened was as they're going to Veracruz, New Spain, which is present-day Mexico, a storm was coming up behind them, and Captain Acuna noticed two pirate ships. And two pirate ships were coming in behind them quickly because they thought there was gold and silver on that ship. Now, those captains couldn't have been that smart because the ship was going to Veracruz, New Spain, not coming from. So if you got gold and silver, you would be leaving Veracruz, not going to. But what happened is, there was a big battle. These two uh, English captains, one on the white line, one on the treasurer, after two hours of battle, they took 60 of the healthiest Angolans and put them on their ships. So now, you see what happened? They're now on two different ships, and those two English ships then made their way to Virginia. And on August 25th, as I indicated, the first ship, the white lion, arrived at Point Comfort, which is present-day Hampton, Virginia. A couple of days later, the treasurer arrived, and they would not allow the treasurer to, to land because there was a warrant for the arrest of the captain of the treasurer, and the ship was to be seized. When the captain got aware of that, was made aware of that, he went off to, to Bermuda. So this starts the story of 20 and odd Africans, and that's what John Rolfe called them when he wrote a letter when he, when he wrote a letter to England. Now, one of the things that's interesting, one of, the, one of the reasons why there's so much documentation about these Angolans is because it was against the international law based on the Treaty of London for any English ship to pirate a Spanish ship. 
Those of you who are from North Carolina, you know the capital of your city, of your state, Raleigh, named after Sir Walter Riley. Wal Ra Sir Walter Riley. Raleigh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to speak fast. You can see the Boston Act. And in 1618, he was beheaded for the same thing. And the captains of these ships did not want to be caught for piracy. So this is really when you begin to get a lot of documentation on these men and women. Now, we know a lot of this stuff from the scholarly work of John Thornton, and he also wrote an article for William and Mary, and he probably will talk an awful lot about that. But these two phenomenal authors set the foundation for the rest of us to know so much about these particular men, women, and children. What we know of them, Angola was part of Congo. It was advanced civilization. We now know that, that they came from the Bantu region. Those of you who have done your DNA, everybody's now beginning to see DNA where they have Bantu in them, and you now can begin to trace it back, so now you know the period of time that it came. And we know so much from the written work from 1483 from the actual explorer that was the first to find this area, Diago Cao. Now, what they found was the kingdoms, their language is very highly developed, and I don't know about you, but my first experience, uh, and, and I mean no insult when I say this, my first experience with Africans as a young child was TV Tarzan. And what happened was when you saw Tarzan, they only had three or four words in their vocabulary. Uh, 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 uh. And unfortunately, that's not what these Portuguese and Spaniards found when they went there. They found a very highly developed language. They found they lived in structured urban communities. They knew how to work and make clothing. They knew how to um, uh, agriculture. They knew about farming and herding. They knew an awful lot. And that's important to remember as we talk about once they arrived here in Virginia. Now, the king in 1491, he was so impressed with these Angolans, and they were impressed with him, and they wanted to know what made them different. He said Christianity, so of course, the king decided, well, maybe my country should become Christian, which meant Catholic, and what happened is they began to change their names to Catholic, uh, uh, the names of Catholic saints, and what happened was, as time went on, within a couple hundred year period, everyone had these Catholic names. Now, when he converted, the Pope was so impressed by this in 1518, the Pope named his son as the first Catholic Bishop of Africa. 1518, notice the year. We're going to talk about Jamestown. Jamestown was a very interesting place when they came here. Founded in 1607. The land was a peninsula. The colony was owned by the London Company. It wasn't owned by England. At first, it was owned by the London Company. And the inhabitants were employees of the London Company. Now, you know, with anyone in your family who started a business the first couple of years, what happens is it's a failure. And for 20 years, the Virginia colony was an absolute failed experiment. They couldn't recruit settlers to come to the colony because so many of them died. It was a high attrition rate. The local tribesmen, the indigenous people, were shooting at them, famine, disease, and poor management. Majority of the men, men came from England were from what they called then, and so many will, will still call today, the peasant class. They were poor, uneducated, often orphaned, homeless, and many had commuted prison sentences. They worked for the London Company as indentured servants. Now, the first recorded Africans, they were sold for food. And when they left the white line, and a few were left behind in the treasurer, they became employees of the London Company like everybody else and they became indentured servants. Now, you know what's interesting? We didn't learn any of that over the last 400 years. We learned that they were just slaves. Now, we know they left Angola as enslaved people, and had they arrived in New Spain, present-day Mexico, they clearly would have been enslaved. And when they first arrived on the shores of Virginia, they were, and they were to be enslaved. But I talked about Captain Acuna. There was an ambassador from Spain to England, Count Sotomayor, and he let King James know that they had stolen Spaniards from the San Juan Bautista. And if they didn't turn them over, they may go back to war, and nobody wanted to go back to war. So he told the king, you need to do a big investigation to find what's going on. Now, Captain, uh, um, uh, Count Sotomayor put an awful lot of pressure on King James. And you know one of the reasons why he put a lot of pressure on King James? His real last name was Kuna. And who else had the name Kuna? The captain of the, white, uh, of, of the San Juan Bautista. It was his cousin. 
And his cousin, when he went back to Spain, he was nearly bankrupt. So there was a vested interest why he wanted to make sure this was taking place. Five minutes. Now, we know an awful lot about these people. In 1620, they were actually in the 1620 Virginia census. And if you see where I have African men, 15, African women, 17, there were 32 listed there. They had names like Margarita Juan Pedro, Catholic names. Many of them spoke multiple languages. They think that one actually spoke English. They were literate, could read, write, and compute. Now, we know some of their names because they were actually in the 1623 census. Now, I don't know why for 400 years nobody knew about this. Who knew? We now know. We also know that some of them had names like Angelo, Edward, John, Jaro, Anthony, Margaret. You know, you can see some of these names. Now, I'm going to show you where these documents are found because some of you probably won't believe me. Now, you've always heard how they were slaves. They had no value. We've always heard this for 400 years around slavery, that the, the, the slaves, the enslaved, had no value. But somehow, somebody made an awful lot of money off of these people who had no value. Now, what's very interesting in the 1624, 1625 muster, you know what we find? that they were listed as servants. And when this muster was taken, it wasn't that one person took the muster. Each of the captains of the various plantations had to go to Jamestown to register the people who were in their particular area. And those plantations eventually became the counties of Virginia. Now, it comes out of this book right here. So those of you who are researchers, don't take my word for it. Go to this particular book right here, Persons of Quality. But you'll also see not just the, hot, the heading, but it also says immigrants, religious exiles, political rebels, men who sold. So all those things I told you about before, it's actually in this particular book. Now, I took one of the pages from the book, and this is what one of the pages looks like. But what's really interesting is, look here. Angelo, a Negro woman in the treasurer. And see what the top it says, she was a servant. And you'll notice that all the Englishmen were listed as the servants as well. So, oh my goodness, we're now finding something that we didn't know before. Now, John Gowen is one of the ancestors that I descend from. And I was amazed at how much information I found about John Gowen, and I'm going to rush through this. He had different spellings to his name. But there was also a land patent taken out on him. And, and those of you who understand head rights, what happened was every rich oligarch in Virginia, for every head they paid to come to Virginia, they got 50 acres of land. They had a right to 50 acres, head right. So you can see with William Ewens, the plantation that John Gowen led, and again, he had different spelling to his name, you can see how he got 1,000 acres for 22 people. That's the definition of a head right. Now, there was another head right, John Upton. Anthony, a Negro, and Mary, a Negro. Now, there's a gentleman here who's doing a study on the Johnson family, and Anthony and Mary became the Johnsons. You can see where he got 1,650 acres based on all of those names, those head rights, H head, he got 50 acres of land. And then you can see Anthony and Mary in the 1624, 1625 muster. So there's an actual documentation on them. But you know what's really interesting about Anthony Johnson he became one of the richest men within his lifetime within the Virginia colony. Anthony Mary, they were on the pirate. They arrived on the Margaret and John in 1622. And Anthony Johnson got 250 acres of land. One minute. Anthony Johnson got 250 acres of land based on the original documentations. He wound up with 2,000 acres of land. Who knew and who would have thought? And you know how he got that, that land? He actually paid for Englishmen to come here, had for each one. Now, there are a number of others who are here. There was also the Catholic martyr. I mentioned they believed that he knew how to read. Here's his documentation here, Juan Pedro. Here he is on the 1624, 1625. Many of these clues were hiding in plain sight. There you go right there. If they came under British common law. That was the law that allowed them to do what they did within, within their lifetimes. I had right the land. These Angolans were so successful within their lifetime. Is this fake news? You can find the documentation all over the colonial records in Virginia. But you know, they're in the court transcripts, judicial rulings, estate papers. And as I wind up, here are many of the places where you can find the documentation. What really I'm doing now is a lot of this is coming to light because of DNA. But you know what's really interesting? Every single one of the accomplishments that these Angolans made were turned against them. 
And when every accomplishment they made were turned against them, what eventually happened is it became the, the slave codes of 1705. And as they begin to sit down, you will see the slave codes of 1705. And these slave codes, they took their individual accomplishments and turned them around. And that became the slave codes. And that's the birth of antebellum slavery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Um, so what I want to do is uh, to talk a little bit about what Linda and I have done, what we did in our book in 2007, but also to try to go a little bit beyond that and to repackage some of it a little bit uh, differently. Uh, one of the things that we hoped we could do and has been pretty successful is to humanize these 1619 people, as Rick pointed out already. Um, I think it's probably true that those of us who did history uh, not even that very long ago really didn't have anything to say about them. Um, I want to talk about their African background a little bit more um, and in relatively specific ways. That is to say, what did they bring with them that might have been helpful to them or in one way or another make their lives uh, a little bit different than might, what it might have been. So um, for those of you that are familiar with the history of Angola, you probably know that there's nothing quite like the density of documentation we have for the period around this event. Um, it's unusual in the level that we have in other parts of Africa. It's not for a very long period of time, but for about 50 or 60 years, we really do know what's going on all over the place. Uh, Linda and I were able to construct a series of maps. If I had brought my PowerPoint, which I failed to do, uh, we could show you we knew where all the wars were waged and who lost. And from that, we could plot very accurately, in many cases, where they came from. So we know that in 1619, uh, the bulk of the people that were exported that year were certainly from Luis Mendes de Vasconcelos' campaign against Ndongo, uh, which resulted in the sack and looting of the city of Cabasa, um, and that the, probably the majority of them were from there. However, we also know that there were two events in the Kingdom of Congo which would have had relevance to this as well. Uh, one of them was the revolt of Antonio da Silva, the Duke of Mbamba, against King Alvaro III. And the other was a similar sort of revolt um, in the province of Mbata um, that he had to face that year as well. Alvaro had a very rocky reign. We don't know if there were a lot of people enslaved in those events, but it's quite possible that some of them would have ended up in this ship, although our, our contention is that that was probably not the majority. So we might ask ourselves one question you could ask about this was, what exactly would they be expecting on the other side of the ocean? Um, and to get at something like this, I said, well, what was uh, the condition of servitude? What was servitude like in Angola? So <clears throat> we know, for example, that if they were from a Kimbundu-speaking area, those who came from Kimbundu-speaking areas, they would have understood that they had become Mubika. So Mubika is the Kimbundu word for slave. Um, and that this word uh, derives from a Bantu root, bik, which in some way or another refers to law or domination. In the catechism, uh, produced in 1642, um, God's law is called ubik ai. For those of you that know Kimbundu or know Bantu languages, you know that the class of nouns that begins with you uh, can easily be um, rendered into English by putting the word ness at the end of it. So this is like law ness, if you can sort of get a feeling for that. Um, and it gives you some idea. It's God's law we're talking about. Um, and that word bik is incorporated in it. So that gives you the idea this is a total domination type of relationship. Such people could be sold and bought at will. We also know that there was a second word that was employed for servile people, kijiko. It has a different etymology. I don't know what it is. Um, but it's pretty clear that kijiko had a very special status. These people had probably once been mupika, but had in one way or another been retained long enough, maybe even generations, that they now had a status which was much closer to what we would call serfs. They were not going to become necessarily free people. There's a term for that as well, anamurinda. Um, that would not have been their, their fate in all likelihood. Um, so we can say that they undoubtedly understood that their condition would be mubika at some point, but that there might be a chance to become kijiko. Um, and if they brought that expectation with them, they actually wouldn't have been too far wrong. Um, with regards to the people from Congo, it would have been a little different. The same basic term in Kikongo for slave, mvika, also found in the catechism, in this case referring to people who were slaves of the devil, um, they were also called mvika. Um, that, I suppose, has a certain interesting resonance to it. 
Um, the Catechism was first published in 1624, but it was undoubtedly in use since the 1550s. Um, what happened to them after that, I can't say for sure, but we do know that the term leke, which is a term used for uh, children, for boys to be specific, uh, well, boys or girls, um, and these would be people who were dependent children. They used uh, people, so if it's applied to an adult, it has the same sort of meaning as boy would have applied to an adult in, in English in this country. In other words, also a dependent, likely to be a permanent dependent, a person without complete rights, but a person with some rights. Um, and so, in many ways, respect of that. So this is part of what they brought with them. Now, the other thing that they brought with them, which is a little bit more complicated, is the question of what exactly was the status of them as Christians. Um, the first thing that must be said is that almost certainly every one of them had been baptized. And almost certainly every one of them had received religious instruction in their indigenous language. In the case of those, if there were some from Congo, they would have been from a long-standing tradition. It was already a hundred and some years old. The Kingdom of Congo had an indigenous ed educational system which brought Catholic teaching to every person in the country. This was handled by Congolese within their system. The members of the nobility regularly served as schoolmasters. And so for them, it wouldn't have been an issue about their religious tradition at all. Um, <clears throat> With regards to those from Angola, however, Christianity did not have the same exact contextual situation. And that is because unlike Congo, which adopted Christianity voluntarily and then uh, took the religion um, as, it, as it was preached within their own country by their own people in a form that was acceptable to them and had been for 100 years. With regards to Angola, however, Christianity was much more of the religion of conquerors. The Portuguese insisted on baptism and religious instruction when they conquered people. And when people revolted, as they did in the 16th century, um, typically one of the things they did was to renounce the church, to burn churches down, to, um, to kill priests if they could do that. So they have a very different relationship to Christianity. It doesn't mean, however, they didn't accept the possibility of Christianity being a real religion. They just didn't like the form the Portuguese were bringing it to them. Okay, so. Uh, nevertheless, they would have received, even those people, would have received um, religious instruction in Kimbundu. Um, according to the Catechism, we have the earliest published version of that was from 1629, uh, but we know obviously that was in use since the 1590s. Um, we know also that the Portuguese were at least reasonably diligent in providing that instruction, although imagine, if you will, that the people receiving it might not have been quite as receptive as Congos would have. So we have a situation where we have one group of people who would you know, be comfortable with Christianity, another group of people who would know about it and now have received formal instruction and be baptized um, uh, along the way. Okay, we, um, we can then say that this intersects very well with an interesting problem that confronted English people intending to hold slaves. In 1618 at the Council of Dort, or, or Dordrecht, um, Protestant, uh, churches in the Netherlands and England in particular, participated in discussions about Protestant theology and Protestant practice. And one of the things that they discussed, although not at great length, was the question of if a Christian could be enslaved. And the answer that the council gave essentially was no, they could not be enslaved. You couldn't hold a Christian as a slave. Um, <clears throat> Whether or not that would be followed in the new world obviously depends on the will and the desire of people involved in this. And as you can imagine, in an environment where holding on to a labor force is important, it's pretty easy to say, well, these guys aren't really Christians or they deny their Christianity. And we know that the English records really say almost nothing about the religion. In fact, they say very, nothing, very little about the people except their existence and their names. We would love to get more than that, but we don't. Um, however, the Dutch records, basically drawn on exactly the same stream of people, that is to say, ships arriving from Angola, captured to the high seas by Dutch privateers and brought to New York, in this case from the Valfish in, in 1626. Um, those people, the people that came on the Valfish, showed up in the office of the governor, Governor Krieft, in 1643, and they said, we've been here as servants for however many years it was, and we think it's time that you let us go. And Governor Kreeft looked at them and said, yes. And so they were granted Washington Square Park. Um, we're still trying to work if we could get Washington Square Park to recognize that the first land grants uh, given to that territory 
was actually given to a whole group of people who have the surname Angola and Congo uh, all over the place. We also know that in the Dutch tradition, um, those guys were prepared to switch from Catholic to Dutch Reformed Church. 28%, this is amazing, 28% of the baptisms in the first baptismal records were of Africans um, in New York. So clearly from that point of view, the Dutch also were significant enough about this that they, they finally passed a law in 1661 to say that no longer would a person who had been baptized in Angola by the papists be admitted to freedom solely for the sake of their being Christian. So this was clearly something that went on. I think this may help for us to understand a little bit about why so many people became free. Um, it's uh, Douglas Steele's uh, relatively famous book on the question of the free communities of color and the Eastern Shore in particular, um, made a great deal about the percentage of people who were freed of that first generation, and it's about as high as any generation before the end of the, of the Civil War. Um, and it was sort of a mystery, although there are many obvious explanations. One of them was that the actual status and discussion of what slavery constituted, how long a person could be held as a slave, was it a permanent condition, was it heritable, these things were all in the air and being swished around. So it's reasonable to suspect that in that period of in, the uncertainty, um, they, they could have let many more people free than they would have otherwise. Um, we can't really ask that question, we can't really answer that question very well, but I do think that this probably did, did have a role to, to play in it. One of the things that Linda and I did when we perused uh, the, the head rights documents that Rick was talking about a minute ago is we looked at the people who had names that were clearly names of uh, Portuguese origin, either people who had literally Portuguese names like Antonio and Pedro, but also names that were easel, easily English translations of those kinds of names. And we thought perhaps these people who show up with those names in the records are the ones who would have been cognizant enough of Christianity to be able to say, yes, I'm a Christian, and maybe even make a good case for that. And so those names stuck with them. What we didn't find was what we called plantation names. Um, so the people that didn't have any name at all, that were just called Negro, 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 those people, um, we think maybe were not people who could make a convincing face case for Christianity. This is a speculative argument. I want to make that clear. Um, I can't say that that's true, but I think it may help us to explain a little bit about the manumission rate. Now, I'm going to sit down and turn it over to James Sweet. Okay. Um, how many of you are familiar with the, the New York Times 1619 project? I'm assuming most of you, yeah. Um, so I, I wanna sort of use that as a jumping off point. Um, for those of you who've, who've sort of followed the, the series, you'll, you'll, re you'll recognize that um, the project really moves from 1619 very quickly to the 19th and 20th centuries. And insofar as that series has drawn attention to, to what I believe, and, and I think it's a truly important project, that being that, that um, African Americans were actually uh, responsible for creating democracy in the United States. I think that argument is one which, which is quite prominent in the series and important, but it really does do sort of an injustice to what was going on in 1619. Um, I'm not even really interested in 1619 itself, to be honest. Um, and I'm really more interested in, in trying to conceptualize that moment as an endpoint. Um, as someone who's primarily a, a historian of, of the African diaspora and the period leading up to this, uh, I, I see 1619 as, as an important point, obviously, for North American history, but not necessarily for the hemisphere, and that's kind of where I want to start. So I'm going to talk in, in really three registers. Um, one is the immediacy of, of the actual ship that brought those first Africans to Point Comfort. Um, the second is in sort of the much broader context of, of what the slave trade looked like in the Atlantic world up to 1619 and how that sort of compares to the history of slavery in the United States moving forward. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about what, what, the, what this looked like, what the entire hemisphere looked like in terms of the African presence at 1619. So first, I'm, I'm not going to cover the ground that, that Rick already covered and that uh, John and Linda have covered quite extensively, but I did want to say that that, that first ship, the São João Batista, um, I, I think it's really important that we recognize that those 350 Africans who boarded the ship in Luanda, that number one, I mean, and I think there are three things we need to recognize. One is that 150 of them perished. 
all right? So w- when you think about the experiences and the, l- and the lives of the people who did survive, that marked their lives as they moved forward. That's number one. Number two, those 22 boys who were left behind in Jamaica were, were young, young men. Um, and they were, and when we talk about boys during this time, we're talking about um, like 12 and under, right? So we're talking about very young boys probably. Um, again, I would urge you to pause and think about the experiences of those boys and those who were left behind on the ship as the ship moved forward. In other words, thinking about kinship, thinking about family, thinking about community. And John has written about this extensively, that, that, and he mentioned it in his talk as well, that um, the likelihood that these folks came from a very small area, probably no larger than 50 miles by 30 miles in Dongo, is quite high. So there's some, there's some reason to believe that they may have even known one another prior to, to their departure from Luanda. So again, I want you to think about the sort of histories moving forward. Um, the third register, of course, is, is the moment when people are, are um, separated just short of Veracruz. Uh, we know that about 122 people arrived in Veracruz. Uh, those are the ones who actually made the entire journey, those, um, those 55 to 60 who ended up on the two ships. Then, you know, there's the 20 and odd who end up in Virginia, and there are about 29 who end up in Bermuda. So again, if you think about this holistically, you're talking about people who come from the same place, who had the same experiences, and had to endure that very long, arduous journey where nearly half of, of the cohort perished. Uh, that, I would argue, irrevocably shaped the ways that they understood their histories moving forward, and I think we need to recognize that. All right, so thinking about, thinking about the sort of broader uh, context of the slave trade, uh, I think it's important to recognize that between, when the transatlantic slave trade opens up in the 1440s, between that time and 1619, uh, roughly 550,000 Africans arrived in the Americas and in uh, the Old World, if you will, Europe, small, smaller numbers, obviously, but 550,000. Uh, that's more Africans than arrived in, in British North America and the United States over the entire period of the slave trade. So just to give you some, some sort of context, in other words, there were more Africans in the Americas prior to 1619 that would arrive in what became the United States for the entire history of the slave trade. We don't really talk about them very often. I think much about their histories, unless you're doing really early African diaspora history or, or histories outside of the United States. But I'm trying to sort of shake loose the parochialism. Um, so what does it look like in 1619? I mean, what do the Americas actually look like in 1619? Well, first of all, I, I think it is important to recognize, and some have already talked about this here, that, that, that there were Africans, obviously, in what would later become the United States, particularly in Spanish Florida. Uh, in 1619, the estimates suggest that there were around 100 Africans in Spanish Florida. Some of you may, may be familiar that there's a um, sort of a rival project that's, that's out there now, the 1526 project, which um, in, maybe in seven years we'll be back here doing this again, talking about the Spanish. Um, but the point is that, that, that this is um, the, the sort of Spanish influence uh, in, in North America is, is prominent during this time. During the same period, though, just a little further south in Mexico, and, and this is where it, I, I, I find the numbers really compelling, and I apologize for sort of reciting numbers, but I do think they're important in helping us understand the cultural context. Um, Mexico, during this time, there were, there were three Africans for every Spaniard in Mexico. Now, obviously, they're in a sea of Native, Native American peoples, but I, again, I, I'm going to sort of run through this. Lima, Cartagena, Panama City, all more African than European during this time. In Brazil, the estimates suggest that there were around 50,000 Portuguese in 1620. Between 1620 and 1625, 156,000 Africans arrived in Brazil. So you start to see the picture here. By the time, by 1619, the vast majority of immigrants in the Americas, and this continues, this trend of course continues, but it's, it is quite striking and predominant at 1619. What makes it even more striking, I think, is the fact that 90% of, of those Africans, uh, particularly those between 1600 and 1625, were coming from Congo and especially Angola. Um, what I want to suggest here then is that, you know, if you think about this and you look at the, the sort of documentation from, from places like Brazil, from places like Cartagena, uh, Brit- or sorry, the Portuguese and Spanish-speaking Americas, uh, we, we see that West Central Africans dominated the immigrant populations of the Americas by, uh, by the time the first Africans arrived in Jamestown or at Point Comfort. 
uh, communities like Cartagena and Salvador in the northeast of Brazil were more deeply influenced by Kimbundu and Kikongo than they were by Spanish and Portuguese. And I would suggest to you that that was also true of the Spanish and Portuguese communities, speaking communities. There were not a small number of white Spaniards and Portuguese who spoke these languages, or at least were conversant in them. Um, I would also argue that they were more definitively shaped by ancestral spirit possession rituals known as Kalundu than by African Christianity and more responsive to the economic and political demands of Luanda than Lisbon or Madrid, let alone London. In short, the idioms and cultures of West Central Africa profoundly shaped 17th century American history, and when I say America here, I mean the Americas writ large, uh, in ways that I think have still only scarcely been treated by many historians and scholars. Um, I like to think about, when I, when I think about uh, 1619 and I think about Point Comfort, I, I, I like to think of conjunctural histories. I like to sort of think about what's going on, at, at, for example, in Jamestown at the same time as what's going on in Cartagena. Uh, we, this, some of this re does require speculation, but at the same time, I'd return back to the story that starts this, this panel, uh, that ship that did leave people from the very same ship, the same region, in different parts of the Americas. Uh, for me, by thinking about Jamestown's West Central Africans, not necessarily as incipient Americans, but rather as people with a common regional homeland and scattered kin across the Americas, we endow them with a different set of histories and different future imaginaries. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to change the sort of uh, narrative and, and sort of, you know, ask us to look at the history of how these 1619 Africans, Angolans, were remembered, or were they remembered? In late August 1619, when John Rolfe casually recorded the arrival and purchase by fellow Jamestown merchants of 20 and odd negers at Point Comfort, he never envisioned that their arrivals <coughs> signaled the beginning of four centuries of the intertwined histories of Native Americans, Europeans, and Africans in British and then the United States of America. By 2019, the African descended population had reached about 40 million strong and comprised 13% of the American population. Although the first uh, Africans laid the foundation for the growth of, of the African American population, it was the 350,000 or so Africans from Angola and other parts of Atlantic Africa who were imported between 1619 and 1860, because there were still illegal slaves coming in, even up to 1860, who were responsible for the demographic explosion. The phenomenal growth of the African American population represented their ability to survive and thrive, despite confronting lifelong enslavement, state condoned murder by masters who follow the law that stipulated that if a master happened to kill his slave while correcting him, in quote, the master shall be free of all punishment as if such accident never happened. The arbitrary treatment of African descended Americans did not end when slavery was abolished as African Americans continue to be the subject of racist laws in the form of Jim Crow, violence, marginalization, economic deprivation, and the like. Despite the enslavement, brutal treatment, and the adoption of laws meant to ensure that their, dependence, uh, their utter uh, dependence and degradation, memories of the first arrivals endured. This was the case despite the fact that in the centuries following 1619, although several events were held 
by the first Virginia, uh, commemorating the first Virginia assembly, the arrival of the first Africans in the history of slavery were largely ignored. References to the 1619 arrival of the first Africans to Jamestown did, however, appear in published histories of, the Virgin of Virginia during the 18th and 19th century. As the 20th century approached, leading white Virginians began circulating ideas for a major exposition to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the settlement on Jamestown. This vision gained momentum after President Roosevelt in uh, 1905 proclamation to celebrate, in quote, the birth of the American nation, the first permanent settlement of English-speaking people on the Western Hemisphere by the holding of an international naval, marine, and military celebration in the vicinity of J Jamestown. Hampton business, Hampton business leaders offered Seawell Point in Norfolk as the local locale for the exposition. The area was located on 340 acres of isolated and undeveloped tract of land that was only accessible by water. The event organized and managed by, was man, organized and managed by, pri, by the private sector and it was scheduled to include 24 countries and 30 states. Although the initial plans did not include the story of Africans and their American descendants, Virginians of African descent had already formed their own committee and mobilized to ensure that their history would be included in the exposition. The group Negro Development and Exposition Company was led by the African-American Giles B. Jackson, who spearheaded a successful campaign to encourage, a grant, to encourage officials to include the African-American story. Indeed, they had already received a grant of $100,000 from the United States government towards the exposition. The committee's efforts paid off when Jamestown officials agreed that the proposed Negro building Um, the proposed Negro building <coughs> would, be, uh, would be built and it would include a series of dioramas which are the famous um, African-American sculptor Meta Warwick was offered a commission to do. Her contribution of uh, 14 di diorama dioramas depicting the entire story of African American, of the African American from 1619, joined displays of 9,100 items, including needlework, agriculture, artwork, patents, books, and newspapers that African American exhibitors had assembled. The objects were exhibited in the Negro Building, which a leading African American architect. W. Sidney Pittman had in fact built. And what is important here is that expositions or expedition, ex exhibits were very important in terms of, you know, a global culture. So having included the African American story within the exposition of 1917, which was in fact to celebrate Jamestown, was a very important part of the inclusion of African Americans. The, fir <clears throat> the first 14 dioramas Warwick uh, produced, in keeping with the ideas of the time, concerning the transform transformation of Africans from primitive and ignorant to civilized, portray the 1619 arrival and the settler inspection of the partially clothed and shackled Africans, as you see in the, in, uh, you know, the PowerPoint. The remaining dior uh, dioramas depicted the progress or evolution of Africans and African Americans from slavery, civil war, reconstruction, 
<clears throat> by emphasizing changes as measured against a single criteria of development or civilization. In this regard, Warwick's dioramas reflected prevailing conceptions of material progress, education, and civilization of African Americans. Although the Negro building was located on an isolated part of the exhibit grounds, which to reach it you had to go off the site in fact, several thousand blacks and hundreds of whites visited the Negro building. The highlight of the exhibit was the speech that Booker T. Washington gave, and I think I have the speech. In his address, Washington reminded the audience of the 20 ancestors who stood on the same spot in 1619, pointed out that their numbers had grown to 10 million, and emphasized the fact that even though the original group did not have a common language, which they did, we now know, and were mostly pagans, which they were not, as we have just been told, their descendants all spoke English and were Christians. Washington's leading critic and competitor, W.E.B. Du Bois, and here we have the Washington Du Bois debate in another context, dismissed the exposition. However, he referred to it as a sort of, and I think I have, yes. He referred to it as a sort of um, Jim Crow endeavor and publicized his opposition by sending out a circular indicating that he was in no way involved with the exposition. <laughs> du, Bois, <laughs> du Bois's reaction, as well as that of some members of the African-American leadership, was in response to the ideas about black inferiority and Jim Crow system that had taken root in the South and Virginia in particular. In fact, in 1907, William Archibald Dunnan published his Reconstruction, Political and Economics, 1865 to 1877, in which he argued that, and I quote, freedom, freedmen were not, and in the nature of the case could not for the generations be on the social, the same social, moral, and intellectual plane with whites. And this fact was recognized by constituting them as a separate class in civil society. Representing the sentiments of the time, officials in charge of the celebrations failed to address Jamestown's role in the origin of American slavery, despite the participation of the African Americans in the exposition. The next opportunity for the 1619 arrival story to Ghana <clears throat> Uh, to Ghana's state and national attention occurred in 1957 when, the American, when America celebrated the 350th anniversary of the Jamestown settlement. Again, the planners initially ignored the, American pres the African American presence and focused almost exclusively on the English settlers and their decisions concerning religion and governance. The role of Pocahontas in this English story was also highlighted. However, as in 1907, an African-American organization, the National Memorial to the Progress of the Colored Race in America, took an activist role and requested that the Planning Commission honor the 1619 African arrivals as well. It was only then that the commission added a public event dealing with the 1619 arrival. They reluctantly permitted African-American elder Lightfoot Solomon Michaud to hold segregated welcoming cer ceremonies, in quote, to mark the anniversary of the first Negro arrival in America. The celebration took place August 20th, 1957 at Festival Park and involved presentations by the National Freedom Day Association, Elder Solomon Michaud Radio Choir, and the Booker T High School Band from Norfolk. Here again, however, the racial treatment of African Americans, 
the origins of slavery and the central role of slavery in Virginia's development were ignored. The actions of the planning committee regarding several nationally acclaimed African American highlighted the continuing exclusion of black Virginians from the planned celebration. As part of the uh, 350th anniversary celebrations, planning officials perused the who's, who is who in America and selected several distinguished Virginians who they invited to a black tie dinner they were holding. Virginia Governor Thomas B. Stanley himself had signed the official invitation. Some of the invitations, however, went to several prominent black Americans, including Dr. C.B. Powell, a successful businessman and owner of the Amsterdam News, Ella B. Stewart, pharmacy pioneer and civic leader, Judge Edward R. Dudley, and Philadelphia clergyman William H. Gray, Jr., among others. However, realizing soon after the invitations had been sent out that they had invited black Virginians, officials contacted the invitees, that's only the black invitees, and informed them that there had been a clerical error. <laughs> and, and that their invitations had been rescinded. Ella B. Stewart's response to the governor was, I won't come but I will, have, I will still have officially accepted your honor, and the honor is still mine. She also added that she planned to keep it in the hope of someday being able to show it to friends and say that Virginia has had a change of heart. C.P. Powell went further and upbraided the governor, noting that, in court, the embarrassment you have caused me, my wife, and me because of my race is nothing compared to the embarrassment you have brought to America. In contrast to the way Virginia officials treated the distinguished African Americans, they went out of their way, they went out of their way to publicize having the newspaper the participation of Sam Robinson, a self-educated African-American public historian who was also the sexton of the Jamestown Church, as well as tour guide of the cemetery. Robinson entertained the visitors as he usually did and was introduced to Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip after he told the royal visitors popular legends about the church and the mother in lost tree story. There was a story about this, um, you know, something that happened around this tree with the mother-in-law, and it was very popular. Uh, it was, this tree was located in the courtyard, in the churchyard. Queen Elizabeth was so impressed with his performance that she directed the British ambassador to the United States to write to Robinson and let him know how much she enjoyed hearing the legends and thanked him for his long service to the church. By the 1990s, and I'm switching here very quickly because I have to finish, what we find is that in fact, 2007, 2007 the 400th anniversary, uh, signaled an entirely new approach to the Jamestown commemoration as far as African Americans were concerned. The publication of new research on the first Africans in Jamestown had finally provided crucial details about the origins, their origins in Angola, their capture by the English pirates, and the circumstances leading to their, arri to their arrival in Jamestown. This meant that museum curators could tell the full story of the first Africans. As Tom Davison, former senior curator of the Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation recalled, we went entirely back to the drawing board. The problem has always been that all of the things that make for a human story in terms of a museum of the Africans were missing. Now we can link, we can talk about the Africans with the same richness that we can talk about the English, 
and the power turns. Plans for the 400th anniversary of the Jamestown settlement began in earnest in 1996 when the Virginia Assembly assigned the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation the task of coordinating Virginia's role in the commemoration. In 2004, the planned celebrations came to national attention when Congress passed a law that established the Jamestown 400 Commemoration Com Commission. The purpose of the commission was to assist, facilitate, and support the planned commemoration both nationally and internationally. In a 2007 debate in the Virginia legislature linked to the planned celebrations, linked the planned celebrations directly to 1619 arrivals when it pointed out that earlier anniversaries had been biased since they had largely ignored the issue of slavery. So this was the first time that slavery was going to be addressed. And essentially what happened is between six, uh, 2007 and 2019 is that in fact the, the focus became celebrating the 400th anniversary of not only the arrival of the first uh, women, large contingent of English women, so an, a, a gender dimension was brought in, the, um, uh, the, uh, make the, um, the, uh, the making of the first assembly, the meeting of the first Virginia assembly, and the arrival of the first Africans. So this year, people in Virginia and elsewhere just went overboard to in fact celebrate the, 2009, the uh, 1619, uh, 2019, the 400th anniversary. I have some slides of this. I can't uh, get to all the materials I have, but as you can see, site of the home of Captain William Pierce, they, they have in fact found the, the site where uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Virginian merchant in whose house, who owned or who had Angela either as a servant or a slash slave. Um, and, and they have actually, uh, a part of that site, they, uh, they have identified it as the Angela site. And they have tours and all the, you know, they really are now integrating the African dimension. And Angela is the big thing. Everybody wants to know more about Angela, the only named female in on the uh, you know in the 1619 uh, 1620-23 list and uh, you know we we know that you know she was on the the latest evidence is that she was on the treasurer and she was not one of those who went to Bermuda she was actually two of the Africans who came on the treasurer that came two days after the white line actually. Were, were left in Virginia, and this Angela was one of those. So I, I want to stop here because I know we want questions, but I wanted to show you there are a lot of families now in Virginia, as you know, we have just you know heard that are claiming you know ancestry, uh, and and uh, you know there's a Tucker family, a lot of things, and what what one wants to know is that have these people taken um, uh, DNA, and some of them I know that some of them have, and they're finding out that, in fact, actually their DNA links them more to West Africa than to Central Africa. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics and questions that, is sure, that are sure to come up in the base as this whole interest in who, if we can trace the direct descendants of the, of the, six, of the 1619 Africans. Uh, one of the things that I also wanted to hear is the Tucker family, one of those major families that, in fact, uh, swear that they have descendants from, um, uh, you know, from Angola, and they are descended because they are descended from the first Africans. Uh, they, are find that they, are, they have not found any evidence of Angela, and therefore there's a lot of caution when the, when the um, guides are giving you the tour. They, they, they cannot say for sure that they have found anything that, is, that, that shows that Angela was present there, but they knew, they know that Angela lived in that, on that site because she was there in 16, 20, 23, 24. Okay, I want to stop here. Uh, let's see, we have a, so, okay.
Here are some squares that were submitted. They had a lot of different projects involving not only Virginia, lots of states. I have a lot of evidence of all the initiatives that were taken by the different states to, in fact, celebrate 2019. Uh, so this has become an American story, not just a Virginia story. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Joseph Inikori is my name. Uh, I uh, teach at the University of uh, Rochester. I'm uh, supposed to be the discussant, uh, but uh, I wasn't sent anything. My colleagues here have made uh, great uh, presentations. It would have been uh, just easy for me uh, to uh, comment on what uh, they've uh, said. Uh, but this is just too important an opportunity yeah, for me to talk about things uh, that uh, I believe uh, we don't talk about enough. Uh, and uh, as you can uh, see, the, the uh, uh, title of uh, what I want to talk about very quickly, uh, I'm... I'm, I'm always frustrated uh, when uh, people talk about African Americans as if uh, they are people uh, who came uh, to the United States after the uh, US economy had been fully developed and they just came to take advantage uh, of uh, the developed American economy. Uh, we don't realize and we don't say enough about it that when we talk about African Americans, we are talking about a people who were very central to the early development of the American economy. And uh, they, 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 they made that contribution at a considerable cost to themselves. And the long lasting consequences of that are still with us. Uh, and, and the kind of policies uh, that uh, ought to be designed uh, to address uh, uh, these uh, lingering consequences, uh, what uh, uh, somebody called uh, the, uh, uh, the lengthening shadow of uh, slavery, uh, we don't talk about it um, uh, enough. So I'm going to take um, an advantage uh, of uh, the great presentations uh, my colleagues uh, have uh, made uh, to very briefly uh, talk uh, about this uh, a subject uh, that uh, uh, bothers me um, uh, a, a, great, a great deal. Now, what I want to do uh, is, um, uh, if I really want to make a detailed presentation, it will take me uh, more than an hour. So what I want to do, uh, what, what, what I want to do uh, is uh, give you a series of uh, tables uh, uh, that indicate uh, the kind of contribution uh, that I'm uh, talking about, and, and, and then uh, 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 say a few things uh, uh, about uh, the, the cost uh, that uh, African Americans uh, had um, uh, to pay uh, for the contribution uh, 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 that uh, uh, they made. Uh, so these are some of the tables that I'm uh, 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 talking about. Um, uh, if only I have uh, enough time, I will comment on each of them, uh, but uh, uh, I can't uh, uh, do that. Uh, uh, all of these uh, are areas, uh, the, these are figures uh, that indicate uh, the important contribution uh, that uh, African Americans uh, made. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the contribution to the United States that I'm talking about is just a subset, a subset of the overall contribution uh, that uh, enslaved uh, Africans uh, made uh, to the economies of the Americas and ultimately uh, to the evolution of what we call the Atlantic, um, the 19th century Atlantic um, uh, uh, economy. Oh, you're you, you not seeing them? Oh, dear. Okay. 
I, I, I don't want to go back. Uh, the, the one that I've just put on now uh, uh, is the uh, a regional distribution uh, of uh, commodity uh, 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 export uh, production in British America, uh, 1663 to 1860. By British America, where I'm uh, referring uh, uh, to where the British Caribbean as well as uh, mainland uh, 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 British uh, uh, American. Uh, and then uh, the uh, second one, uh, the, uh, uh, the table four way is. Um, uh, a cutting, really cutting export. That's really the, 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 the peak uh, of uh, the, the contribution. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, without uh, the labor of enslaved uh, Africans, uh, very little uh, uh, cutting uh, would have been produced, and yet uh, cutting is so central uh, to the um, uh, develop, early development um, uh, of um, uh, the, the uh, uh, US uh, e economy. Uh, I, I just want to, um, uh, as a way of summarizing, uh, I, 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 I have so many other things I want to talk about. I, I just want to s uh, use uh, uh, this opportunity to quote uh, uh, from uh, 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 Douglas North, um, uh, who actually uh, uh, studied uh, the, the uh, early uh, development uh, of um, uh, uh, the uh, US um, uh, uh, e e e economy. Uh, and and, and, and uh, what he said uh, can be seen as a, a kind of summary uh, of um, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, this is the uh, Nobel Prize uh, economist uh, talking about um, uh, uh, the, the contribution uh, of uh, uh, cutting uh, to the early development uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, let, let, let me read this out uh, very quickly. Uh, in this period, uh, that is the 1830s, uh, of rapid growth uh, of uh, the U.S. economy, uh, it was cutting uh, that initiated uh, the uh, uh, concomitant uh, expansion of income in the size of domestic markets and creation of the social overhead uh, uh, investments uh, in the course of uh, the role uh, in, in the marketing uh, of uh, uh, cotton uh, in the Northeast, uh, uh, which uh, we are in the, in, in, in which we are to uh, facilitate uh, uh, the, the subsequent uh, rapid growth uh, of manufacturers. Direct income from uh, the cotton trade uh, was uh, probably uh, no more than uh, six percent uh, of any plausible um, estimate. Uh, of an, a national income uh, uh, which we might uh, employ. Uh, but uh, when income uh, from uh, uh, cutting exports, including uh, shipments uh, uh, to um, uh, 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 textile uh, uh, mills uh, in our own uh, uh, Northeast, uh, grew from uh, $25 million in 1831 to $70 million uh, in 1836, it set in motion the whole process of accelerated expansion, which culminated in uh, 1939. Certainly, the views of contemporaries, northern observers as well as southerners, uh, southerners uh, support uh, the proposition, or uh, support the position. Uh, that in this period, uh, cutting was indeed a king. Uh, now, the importance of cutting is uh, recognized. Uh, every, everyone uh, uh, talks about that uh, in the early development of the U.S. economy. But who was producing that cutting? It was African Americans. Uh, one can get into details of why it was so important for where the uh, enslaved uh, Africans uh, to be the ones uh, uh, producing uh, uh, the um, uh, 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 rock, rock cutting that made uh, uh, so much contribution to the early development uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, economy. Um, I had wanted to talk about uh, the continuation of uh, slavery in a different form uh, even after when uh, the formal abolition uh, in the um, uh, uh, 1860s. Um, uh, I don't want to talk about that 
the, the, the information that I had wanted there to show uh, is there. You can uh, uh, look at it uh, the way uh, uh, the uh, uh, 13th Amendment uh, to the Constitution uh, uh, created uh, the legal basis uh, for wrongful uh, uh, and enslavement uh, uh, through the law courts. Uh, that's something, a uh, quite an interesting story uh, about uh, slavery um, uh, in the United uh, uh, States. Uh, now, this is uh, quite an interesting um, uh, a letter were, uh, written by uh, a woman uh, whose uh, uh, husband uh, had uh, been enslaved uh, because um, he sort of, the court decided he committed some offense uh, and was uh, sentenced uh, for uh, a, a period. Usually the way the 13th Amendment works or worked uh, to uh, create the opportunity for uh, enslavement uh, is uh, you are found guilty, um, whether yeah, it's real or, or, or imagined, uh, you are found guilty and then you are given a fine, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. And if you cannot pay, uh, then you are enslaved uh, in order to uh, get somebody uh, who will who make the payment and then you work uh, for, for that person. Now, this is an interesting case of a woman uh, whose um, uh, her husband uh, was uh, 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 enslaved uh, 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 that way, uh, uh, saved uh, the uh, length of uh, the uh, sentence, uh, uh, but uh, he continued uh, to remain uh, enslaved, uh, so much so that uh, even uh, the person who bought um, the man uh, told uh, the wife uh, that uh, if she would um, uh, work uh, for him, uh, uh, that could uh, uh, be uh, uh, added uh, to uh, the service of the husband and therefore uh, shorten the period of um, uh, enslavement. She did the work uh, for a long time. The, the whole promise that was made uh, was not fulfilled. And as she complained, uh, when uh, she um, uh, 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 left, uh, everything she had uh, uh, was uh, taken uh, uh, from her. Uh, and so we're here she is uh, uh, complaining to the president, uh, writing this letter to the president uh, about uh, uh, the uh, injustice uh, that um, is being committed against um, uh, her husband. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about uh, very, very quickly, yeah, is, is, is a long narrative that I'm uh, cutting in, in bits and pieces. Uh, the contributions that I was talking about, as I said, uh, were made at a considerable cost to the enslaved African Americans. And uh, much of uh, the uh, long lasting consequences uh, of uh, those uh, costs are still with us uh, till today. And uh, when in the 1960s uh, efforts were made, uh, to find some way uh, of uh, dealing with the uh, uh, long-lasting uh, uh, consequences, um, we came uh, by the idea of affirmative uh, action, uh, the executive uh, order where, uh, by um, LBJ, uh, leading Ben Johnson. Uh, the affirmative action was uh, seen as something that, that uh, will deal uh, uh, with um, uh, the, the uh, 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 long-run uh, impact uh, of um, uh, the, 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 the whole uh, issue we're talking about. Uh, now, my question is, how much did the affirmative action as defined, as legally defined, how much did it really contribute to dealing with the long-lasting consequences of enslavement. Uh, and the argument I'm developing here is to say uh, that if you look at uh, the affirmative action carefully, it focused exclusively on the discriminations of today. It, had, it has nothing to say about the consequences of enslavement uh, that continued uh, to linger. Uh, and so you have uh, those uh, two uh, uh, definitions uh, uh, that I present um, from uh, authors uh, who've uh, tried to say what um, uh, affirmative um, uh, action uh, really uh, uh, was. 
And uh, what made the uh, Lady Ben Johnson's affirmative uh, action, uh, the, the executive order were 11246, uh, what made it really so surprising to me uh, is that uh, President Johnson himself knew very well the lingering consequences of uh, 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 slavery. And, and this comes out very clearly uh, in a speech uh, that he made uh, uh, in uh, 1965. Uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm going to read this out. It's just too important uh, for me to leave um, uh, just hanging there. Uh, here is uh, uh, Johnson speaking. Uh, you do not take a person who had uh, been uh, hobbled uh, by chains, uh, liberate him, uh, bring him up uh, to the starting uh, gate uh, of a race and say, you are free to participate with all the others. And still justly uh, believe uh, you have been uh, uh, completely fair. It is not enough uh, to open the gates of opportunity. All of our citizens uh, must have the ability uh, to, to walk uh, through those gates. Men and women of all races are born with the same range of abilities. But ability is not just the product of birth. Ability is stretched or stunted by the family you live with, the neighborhood, the school, and the poverty or richness of your surroundings. It is, a, it is the product of a hundred unseen forces playing upon the infant, the child, and the man. So, if this is the case, why wasn't uh, the affirmative action, uh, the uh, executive uh, order, why wasn't it uh, designed uh, in a way uh, that uh, will not deal only with the uh, current uh, uh, consequences of discrimination, but the long history of um, a, a discrimination. Uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, that's uh, an, an important uh, point uh, uh, to, uh, to take note of. Uh, now, I'm being told I have uh, uh, one minute. I'm uh, trying to find the best way yet uh, to utilize uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, one, one minute. Uh, and uh, I'm um, drawing the conclusion that uh, everything we talk, we say about uh, the affirmative action, the affirmative action was not designed to deal with the uh, legacy of slavery. And yet, we are made to believe that it was supposed to deal with it. And so when African Americans don't show that uh, they are benefiting from it in the way uh, that we take care of them, um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the long-lasting uh, consequences of enslavement, African-Americans are blamed for it. They don't take, they're not taking advantage uh, of um, uh, uh, this uh, opportunity. Uh, and I make the argument, uh, when uh, uh, we had uh, President Obama, a lot of people were saying, uh, what did he do for African-Americans? There was nothing he could do that is backed by the law. Had he designed any specific uh, a program for African Americans, he would have ended up uh, in the law courts and he would have lost because there is no law, no legal basis uh, uh, for doing anything specifically for African Americans. And, and so uh, the, my argument here is to say uh, uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, ask Congress uh, to pass an enabling act upon which policies uh, that are designed specifically to deal uh, with this uh, problem will have the legal backing. As of now, there is none. And it is because there are no legal bases, that is why we hear of um, uh, the kind of arguments uh, that uh, uh, white people uh, make uh, reverse uh, discrimination. 
uh, a lot of uh, these um, win the cases in the law court because there are no legal backing uh, uh, for anything that you want to do uh, to help people uh, who've lost so much uh, and have not been able to uh, uh, build up uh, the kind of um, uh, uh, capital, human capital, fiscal capital, uh, as uh, others have had the opportunity um, uh, to do. Uh, and, and this time I uh, hear things said, even by uh, the lawmakers, I see a lot of ignorance about the issues they are talking about. Uh, and uh, one of the things I'm uh, hoping uh, that uh, one could achieve um, uh, when we have uh, this kind of opportunity is to talk to more people who will spread the whole idea that we do have a problem here that we are not dealing with. We are not even speaking about it. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if we can uh, get that kind of a uh, message across, I will have been able to at least accomplish something. I thank you. apologize to him that I failed to introduce him <laughs> when I was introducing everybody else. So um, until they come and throw us out, uh, we, could, uh, we could do questions. I see a question right here. people have to the people that Ira Berlin talked about as the Atlantic Creoles? Mm -hmm. Or is this a parallel community? Because uh, I, don't, I don't know. I know that there were people along the coast who were mixed with Portuguese, who were mestizo or metis or whatever you want to call them, who often worked in the ports. But from what I'm hearing from you, this is a different community from them. And that would have interesting implications in terms of how people were interacting with each other uh, once they got to Virginia. Uh, uh, well, I can answer that. Linda, uh, Linda, Linda, I, Paul. Yeah, Linda, Linda and I worked on this question, and we were initially quite inspired by Ira's work on that. Um, it, is, it is not the translators and the people on the Atlantic coast that we were dealing with so much, but as communities that had much deeper and much longer connections with Europe than they did and larger communities. So it, particularly, let's say, in the Kingdom of Congo, the Christianity had come in 1491. The Congolese had embraced that faith. They had built a whole network to make it happen in their country. Um, and even in Angola, there's also the situation where there's a colony. There were lots of people within that colony who had already become integrated into that setting. And there was missionary work beyond that. So West Central Africans really had a much more uh, complicated, but also demographically much larger connection with this larger Atlantic world. So we talked about Atlantic Creoles in our book. That was part of what we were talking about. In fact, it's in the title. <laughs> um, well, now let me say this. Those people who came from those regions, first of all, they were rarely enslaved because they were usually employees and so on. They would, of course, fit into this group as well. Um, people from West Africa, for example, in, in the region around Guinea-Bissau, there were people in that community who also touched this way. Um, and so that would have been a part of the group as well. Yeah, I mean, we're not excluding them. It's just that this particular group was demographically really overwhelming relative to everybody else. Okay, and you had a question. Yeah, yeah. Two quick comments. First of all, I really appreciated uh, Professor Haywood's talk. That was really excellent. My question is kind of an activist question. All of this work is being done now. What Professor Inakori said, in my view, affirmative action was not linked to reparations for slavery or anything because the country hasn't acknowledged that anything is owed. I'm wondering to what extent all of this work is connected with, kind of like they're saying right now, we have to make the, a, a case to the American people that the president has to leave. There needs to be a case made to the American people that there is this debt for all these wor this work that has not been compensated by any previous policy nor affirmative action because it's very different. And so I'm wondering, uh, you know, apart from trying to get something passed through Congress, I think that, that the country needs to believe 
that something is owed for all of this. And what I've seen today, I think you've got a lot of very rich uh, work that could make the case better. So I'm just curious to know if there are uh, plans to do that. Well, thanks for the question. I don't know if it's planned so much, but I think because of the national kind of a, a way in which the 1690, the 400th anniversary has been celebrated, that something is there. There's a consciousness. It, you know, Congress passed laws. State governments passed laws. So I think that type of momentum have to be continued. So more research and more researchers looking at specific areas and you know, really educating the community as to the intertwined nature of the you know, struggle for what America is for democracy. I think that's the way it has to go because you cannot, there's lots of people in Virginia and elsewhere who are white but who have some Angolan, some African ancestry they need to be in, integrated into you know, sessions like these and, and be part of, in fact, the dialogue. And so it's not just the African American community must be working alone. It has to be united, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me just say, comment on uh, the point you made. Actually, yeah, the point you made is exactly the things uh, that I've been talking about that they bother me a lot. Uh, it is not that we are, as scholars, it's not that we are not addressing these issues, but the problem is that uh, we don't try to advance that knowledge beyond the academy, uh, and, 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 and so when I listen to Congress people talk, uh, it's as if uh, the kind of things uh, that we do in the academy uh, is not available to uh, uh, these uh, uh, fellows. Uh, so I, I think the responsibility we have is to, uh, first of all, articulate the, the solution, but more than that, be able to get the rest of the country involved. So that uh, when we talk about things of this nature, people don't think we're just speaking to ourselves. Uh, the colors, elites, and all of that kind of thing, uh, we, 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 uh, is, they are not one of us. Uh, now, I hold the academy to some degree responsible for that that we don't make enough effort uh, to advance the knowledge uh, we acquire in the academy beyond the academy. I, I think the, point, the question you asked was a very interesting one, and I think it's more on target than perhaps you realize. I think Linda's point about how 1619 has begun to start a whole movement in terms of totality of African American history. I like to now call it American history of African descendants, because it includes Europeans and Africans as well. But you're beginning to see discussions where people are taking pride in their free ancestors, but they're also taking tremendous pride of their enslaved ancestors. And through those discussions, you're beginning to see the universities, the colleges, the insurance companies beginning to look at how do we identify those enslaved people who helped build the university, or who helped build this particular corporation. So you're beginning to see the corporate community begin to address these issues. Now, I don't know if the insurance companies realize that there may be some legal peril at some point down the road, and that's why they need to start identifying them. But our organization receives at least once a month, if not twice a month, organizations that are now trying to trace the, ant the descendants of these enslaved ancestors. In fact, we're working with the Netherlands now on a number of men who were buried over there after World War II, and they're trying to look for their descendants. So there's a whole movement now where people are trying to use DNA and other genealogical uh, tools to help find these descendants, 
And while they're not talking reparations, they're certainly talking about doing such things as providing free tuition like Georgetown Project is now doing for those young men and women at Georgetown. So I think it's an interesting question. I think you might be maybe three, four, five years ahead of yourself in that question, but I think it's something you're gonna to start to see movement as we go down the road because the question you're asking, I think other people in the boardroom are asking those very same questions. We've been told we have to terminate. So thank you for your participation and stick it with us. That's at Northeastern University. Thanks. It's at Northeastern University. There were buses down out at the lobby. I'm not sure if they're still circulating. If not, there's directions via public transit in your program. But if you head toward the lobby, we'll have volunteers there to help you. Oh, oh the last bus is downstairs now, so hurry if you want to get on the bus. 